the Constitutional Court has heard arguments for and against the traditional and Khoisan Leadership Act. The act has been criticized for keeping in place apartheid boundaries and locking traditional communities into those jurisdictions. It has also authorized traditional leaders to enter into investment deals with third parties without the consent of the people. To discuss this, we're joined by an attorney from the Legal Resources Center, Wilmeen Wickham. Thank you very much, Wilmeen, for your time um, this morning. Let's start with a bit, little bit of background, rather, as to how we got here. Um, so, in we know that we inherited a legacy of, uh, from the Bantu stance uh, of, uh, you know, the very notorious Bantu Authorities Act, which, which locked people into uh, boundaries that created the Bantu stance and um, really made traditional authorities no longer pe servants of their people, but servants of the state. Uh, and that was all part of facilitating uh, a separate development in apartheid, really. Uh, so, it, under the Constitution, um, traditional authorities, but in particular customary law, community customary law, um, has been recognized very explicitly. And so, in 2003, Parliament, for the first time, enacted legislation um, regulating traditional leadership. And there were, there, there were great expectations that they would dismantle the inherited Bantu authorities system. But unfortunately, the legislation that was adopted back in 2003, it was called the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act, um, simply entrenched those boundaries and the traditional leadership positions as they were at the time. So you, you bear in mind that, you know, we have a history of significant forced removals um, and, and government collusion uh, uh, and involvement in traditional leadership structures. Um, and so... Understandably, communities were, were outraged at the time and for the last two decades have felt the effect of that legislation. I think at the heart of the complaint um, about the old legislation was the fact not only that it entrenched these boundaries, but that there are absolutely no way for community members to hold their leaders to account. It is absolutely in the hands of government uh, who has done nothing uh, to, to, to prevent uh, abuse. Now, uh, in a couple of years ago, the, the um, Na National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces adopted new legislation. Um, and ostensibly, this was to, to bring Koen Sun leaders who had never been uh, recognized before, to bring them into the fold. But communities obviously saw this as an incredibly important moment to raise all the incredible difficulties that have arisen from the previous legislation and ask Parliament to amend it, to give them some power back in order to hold their leaders to account. Unfortunately, the parliamentary process was not one of meaningful consultation, and what was passed was legislation that not only entrenched the problems of the, of the previous Framework Act, but in some instances made it even worse. What is the resistance? So, as I say, I think at the heart of it um, is the fact that there's no way to hold the leader to account. Um, so, in, in the court case on Thursday, some community members um, told the court uh, about, you know, how they had tried everything to hold obviously corrupt and abusive traditional leaders to account. And, of course, um, that's not all traditional leaders. There are many that do a stellar job and that do serve their communities. But... The point of the legislation should be to, to enable communities who are not that lucky to hold their leaders to account. Um, and yeah, that, that was at the heart uh, of the complaint. And of course, if they're able to hold their leaders to account, then they are able to, to mitigate any other damage that, that, the, that the act um, can and will do. Mm. I guess maybe the resistance on the part of the, um, the parliamentary process that you speak of that didn't help much on the part of government um, that it would also seem isn't helping much. Uh, why is that? Do we know? So, I mean, there's definitely some politics involved um, in, in legislation that deals with, with traditional leaders. We've seen... Um, uh, over the last couple of decades um, that, that government is, is, is very cautious of um, offending traditional leaders in any way. It's, it's not clear why, but that is certainly part of the politics of it. Uh, the, the public participation process 
you know, it was just one where they were going through the motions. And hearings mm. were held as the Constitution requires the National Assembly, the provinces, to do meaningful participation. Um, and, you know, so that, so that law actually speaks to the needs of people. Now, many of those meetings and hearings were held, but uh, community members were not really given a chance to speak, and where they were given a chance to speak, none of that informed anything that was done at Parliament. And sure. to be frank, community members experienced Parliament um, in many of these hearings as, you know, as being as being arrogant and aloof and not interested in what the communities had to say. And for all those reasons and many others, the process was really was unconstitutional. Oh my, um, that sounds quite disturbing. Uh, you speak of the process as being just going through the motions, the public participation um, that is. And so if, communities, if community members were not allowed to speak, those who did get a chance to say something, what did they have to say? So they raised um, concerns about how the legislation, the, the Framework Act that had gone before, how that had impacted their lives. And so, you know, we talk here about every aspect um, of, of people's lives who, who live in, in traditional communities, and that's 20 million South Africans. And so they talk about the fact that their land rights are not protected at all, and in many instances are just, are, are just signed away. Uh, the same with any other um, assets that the community might have. They, have no, they, they read in the newspaper that another deal has been struck um, over, over, over land and resources that they own. Um, there are also you know, small uh, everyday rights infringements. So, for example, what, what often happens um, is that uh, traditional leaders are responsible for giving people um, proof of address, proof of mm. existence, really, when they go to home affairs, when they go to the bank, uh, when they go to the municipality. And if you're not aligned or if you're, if you're a, a, a dissenting voice in the community, uh, then many people told Parliament, well, then, then you have no chance of getting um, a proof of address. And therefore, it becomes difficult to get an identity document, to, to, to get a social grant, etc. So the impacts are, are really widespread and enormous. Um, and in the face of that, there's simply nothing they can do to change it. Yeah, and, and I think that maybe that's the next point, because then who do you run to next? If this process is failing these 20 million South Africans, then who do they go to? Exactly. And what we have seen, so for example in the Northwest, um, where of course for many communities the stakes are really high because you know the, the, platinum is involved, mining very often, uh, and the only person who, who has the power in terms of the legislation currently to do something about a traditional leader is the Premier. Uh, but we've seen in the Northwest, certainly, where, the, where commissions of inquiry, etc., have, have told uh, the, the provincial Premier that a traditional leader is acting in a corrupt way and, and, and must be removed. We've seen just a complete lack of political will to do that. We have not in this country seen a single traditional leader being removed um, on the grounds of, of you know, not serving the community or, or, or of fraudulent activities. It's never happened. And yet we see those activities and those problems widespread across the country. Sure. What is the quality of, of, of life for, for people who are still under these traditional leaders? I guess maybe I also ask in terms of uh, there will come a point in time where people have their backs against the wall and, and they will then take it upon themselves to change their lives and whatever that looks like will look like it when we, I guess it plays itself out. But what kind of lives are they living under these people? Because it does not sound good. Um, so, and, and let me just clar be clear again, it's not all traditional leaders, but yeah. there are some, uh, certainly some that are, re that are really problematic. And so, to your question, I mean, remember these are, if you look at the map of the traditional um, areas in South Africa today, it, it fits precisely upon an old Banchistan map. So, it's literally everyone who, who were forcibly removed into Banchistan areas, there were the poorest areas in the country, we know, when, when, when uh, democracy came, and that remain the poorest areas uh, to this day. And so, you know, that's just a, a, another, another level of, of, of incredible difficulty for these communities. And what we've seen is 
Um, you know, some traditional leaders impose a form of tax um, um, on, on their communities, um, and if that is not paid, then you can lose your home, uh, you, you can be denied burial rights. Uh, we see that quite often, that you're simply, you're not allowed to bury someone, uh, a family member, because taxes are, are, are not up to date, and these taxes in themselves um, uh, should really be unlawful. Um, and so, you know, in, in many instances in the community, there's also quite violent repression. So, so very often, um, well, I should not say very often, but it does happen that traditional authorities um, have their own kind of internal policing system, um, which is, of course, completely unregulated and unlawful, uh, but, you know, who come down very hard on any form of resistance. So resistance itself is not easy, and it's actually very brave um, of people to, to stand up and try and resist. Hmm. Please do indulge me, and I do beg your pardon, um, will mean um, if yeah, this falls outside your scope, but you often hear um, um, a lot of talk about land reform in South Africa. But the picture that you have just painted, in my very simple thinking, it then sounds as if it's, it's, it's a, it's a feel-good phrase. It's something that we bandy about. But if the laws are still um, being entrenched from years ago that no longer serve current-day South Africa, then what? Is this all but a dream? Well, that's a very, very uh, good question. And, you know, what, it, what the Constitution did um, is it, Section 25.6 of the Constitution uh, mandated the, the, the state to um, secure the tenure of the millions of South Africans who were never able to, to have uh, a strong land rights. And so that, of course, applies to all these communal areas. Um, and today, uh, how many decades later, there still is no legislation that secures the land rights of people in these areas. There have been attempts at legislation, um, and in fact one piece of legislation was passed, but that one was also declared unconstitutional because it simply uh, placed overwhelming power in the hands of traditional leaders and not in the hands of, of the community members. You may remember the Ingonyama Trust uh, uh, sorry, uh, case that happened uh, last year, mm. and it was exactly about that. It was in that case the Ingonyama Trust uh, tried to to give leases to the people living on on their land, and those people went to court and said, "But we we own the land. We community members own this land. We own the land." Um, that, that we live on and that we, that we use as grazing rights. We can't now be reduced to, to tenants. Um, and, of course, the court found that that is entirely correct. And so that was, that's just an example um, of this very murky area that is really having a devastating impact on the lives of, of millions of South Africans. Hmm. Well, Mean Wickham is an attorney with the Legal Research Centre. Thank you very much for your time this morning.